All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, my name is Rob Fisher. I'm an associate professor at the Mandel School at Case Western Reserve, and I'll be part uh, presenting and part moderating today. Uh, this is uh, an exciting session, we hope, and hope you'll get a lot out of it, um, focused on the fundraising profession uh, with some important findings re uh, relevant to uh, North Northeastern Ohio, but also we think uh, that speak very clearly about kind of the state of uh, nonprofit fundraising professionals um, across the country. Uh, the, the lay of the land for the session will be, um, in a moment I'll introduce uh, Dan Mansour and he and I will present uh, some findings from our research uh, here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, and then we'll turn to uh, two discussants, uh, Bob Kane and also uh, Cecil Lipscomb and I'll introduce them following uh, Dan's presentation. Uh, at any point during the the presentation or the uh, the comments, um, please feel free to post uh, in the uh, chat any questions you may have or observations. We welcome those. Um, and then following uh, Bob and Cecil's comments, uh, we'll have a general Q and A session, and we'll we'll go we'll start with anything that popped from the the chat comments and questions, and we'll also ask uh, for more at that time. Uh, so let me begin with a, a quick introduction, and I'll just note, I think we're posting in the chat a uh, link to the bios for all the speakers today. So you, if you didn't have a chance to look at those, uh, you can see the full bios. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dan Mansour, who is the president of uh, Good Works uh, Group. Uh, and uh, you can read more about Dan, but you may know him from his uh, recent stint at United Way of Greater Cleveland as the Chief Philanthropy Officer, um, and also as a, an instructor in uh, philanthropy in uh, the Mandel School uh, Masters in Nonprofit Organizations Program. And Dan uh, was my um, cohort in crime in, in carrying out the study that we're talking about today, so I really want to uh, begin my, my introduction to the study and then uh, turn it over to Dan. So I'm gonna share my uh, slides here. So before we get rolling, I, I just wanna uh, quickly acknowledge the Kelvin and Eleanor Smith Foundation who uh, invested in and um, underwrote the costs of the study that we'll be talking about, which was carried out last year. Um, and, you know, this is, this is ultimately a, a fairly rare sort of study. Um, there's not been a lot of work done on assessing um, how nonprofit fundraisers um, are feeling about their ability to do their work successfully and, and how education and other supports play a role in their success. So we're really excited to be able to report on this work today. So just to, just to pull back and, and think broadly about how this work fits into the sector, uh, the nonprofit sector, you know, as a distinct field of knowledge, fundraising, nonprofit fundraising is, rel is, is quite young. You might think that nonprofit management is young, but even within nonprofit management, uh, the idea of specialists in nonprofit fundraising um, is even younger. Um, so, you know, with that, as we think about how many, many fields of practice have gone from kind of uh, figuring it out to becoming more institutionalized and um, educational programs developing, um, certifications, uh, all those markers that you might think of as uh, ways to authenticate a profession. Each, each area and, and fundraising has, has had its own trajectory in that occurring. We do have a couple of, of uh, handholds in 
uh, the fundraising world, one being the certifi certified fundraising executive credential, which has been available from 2001. Um, but as, as, a, as, a, as a national model, um, it has, you know, if you think of the full body of nonprofit uh, professionals who do fundraising, it reaches only a tiny share of those uh, working in that space. And then the, the other uh, major handhold I would point you to is the development of curricular guidelines for nonprofit management, which uh, were codified by the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council in 2003. And they included in those 16 competencies for nonprofit um, executives, the idea of funding, fundraising and resource development is one of those key practice areas. So any program in nonprofit management is expected to deliver some um, content and expertise around those, those key functions. But then again, uh, if you think of all the nonprofit professionals you know, how many of them have a master's in nonprofit management or a certificate? Um, again, it's not reaching the, the very large population of working professionals uh, to the degree that we, we might hope. And what we know from the evidence in the field is that often the career path for individuals that end up in fundraising roles is, uh, is winding, uh, and many have not had uh, specific training to support them in that kind of work. So that is one observation that we had going in from other work and one that we'll hear more about today. And why should we care about this? Well, there, there are some concerns is, as you think about nonprofit fundraising and a few that have been well documented, uh, one related to job satisfaction issues among fundraising professionals, uh, partly in, in uh, that idea of feeling effective and feeling successful, but also coupling with the idea that uh, fundraising has received uh, a, a sense of stigma around the profession that it's not, it's, not why, it's not wildly loved by all in the sector um, and that uh, professionals working in those roles have sometimes felt that stigma as a heavy burden. We also see this playing out in the, the turnover in these uh, roles. So national data has showed that uh, the tenure of fundraisers is something like just short of a year and a half. And even those with titles like chief development officer have had uh, lengths in position of uh, under three years. So that turnover, while some turnover and some folks leaving their positions is a sign of opportunity, a sign of uh, progress in their profession, uh, their career, uh, we know that many of those are folks who are leaving those roles due to uh, that feeling of, of lack of success or pressure or um, a whole variety of negative um, aspects of the work. And then the last one I would call out is this concern about diversity in the profession of fundraising. Uh, that, you know, still uh, now the, these roles are dominantly held by white individuals and has been predominated by men in the profession, though we've seen uh, great progress of uh, women moving into these roles. But uh, at the same time, we've also seen that uh, women have been paid uh, uh, far less than their male counterparts, even in the same kinds of roles. So we have some issues around attracting good people, diverse people to these fundraising roles that we need to be aware of as we think about how to support uh, these professionals. So coming now to our uh, present study that we want to talk about today, um, this played out over a series of uh, about nine months last year, where we did initial research looking at what had been has been done around the country, not just in in understanding what uh, fundraising um, the fundraising profession looks like and and how folks have gotten educated, but what supports uh, exist already uh, nationally and in our region in terms of education and other uh, professional supports. We then moved to a round of in-depth interviews with key informants, so about 30 of those folks working in philanthropy and also in, in nonprofits uh, to understand better how um, 
how these issues are playing out. And from that, those in-depth interviews, we developed a, um, a survey that was then uh, broadly available in our region of folks working in nonprofit uh, fundraising roles. And as you'll see, we got a, a, uh, just over 200 uh, respondents to that survey. Um, and then in the latter, latter part of 2020, we were kind of distilling what we, what we heard and uh, making some recommendations as we'll talk about. So quickly on the, the, the folks who did respond to the survey, uh, we, these are just some descriptive data points we wanted you to have in mind that uh, the majority of folks who responded to this survey do identify as fundraisers. About two thirds um, said they were, you know, felt squarely that they were fundraisers. Uh, the majority had a, a mass, uh, master's degree, uh, and most of the rest had a, uh, a bachelor's degree. On that, how long they'd been in their position, uh, while most had been, um, uh, on average, had been in the, in the sector nearly 20 years, they'd been in fundraising about 13, uh, and they reported that you know, almost 92% of their time was spent in fundraising and development roles, uh, but activities rather. And then on, again, on tenure, they've been with their current employer about four years. So in fundraising, 13 years with their current employer, four years, but these are averages. There was quite a span in this. Uh, some who had, you know, been, been uh, changed positions very recently. And then on average, uh, the folks reported that the organization they currently are with had four staff working in a fundraising capacity. But again, a wide range here from uh, one, there was, I think the one was the single largest group, uh, but skewed very highly up into the 20s for some very large corporatized nonprofits. In terms of organizational budget, you can see we had about 15% of respondents, their organizations were, uh, had an annual budget under a million, a quarter between one and three million, uh, a quarter between three and 10, and over a third were from nonprofits uh, with budgets above 10 million. So this obviously does not reflect the sector writ large. Uh, we hoped to have many more respondents from smaller organizations, but probably speaking to the reality that they are hard pressed, uh, overworked, uh, they were not uh, inclined to respond to this survey. So one flag for us is to think about how these findings uh, generalize to those much smaller organizations. Um, and then in, in regard to what training they were pursuing, uh, about 88% 80, uh, said that their empl employer paid at least something towards those trainings, but a third were using their own funds, their own personal money to pay for the training that they uh, were receiving. And some, some folks were only really consuming um, free, dominantly online uh, training. All right. So now just, just a couple of things to set the stage about what kinds of fundraising topics folks were interested in. We asked them about their, uh, their need for different kinds of training. And here you can see the, the interest in training by some topic areas that we suggested to them. Um, so something like major principal gift uh, fundraising, 85% of folks I saw that as very or somewhat um, of interest to them. Uh, things like stewardship, uh, behavioral sciences uh, was um, indicated there was a large interest there. So you can see those top four categories, more than three quarters of folks were uh, really quite interested in them. And then things like social media, annual fund, capital campaigns, more in the two thirds range. And really the only one that was less than the majority uh, was fundraising events planning, which I've, I've been told by colleagues that's a, that's, that's 
going, it's, it's completely going through a change in how we think about those events. Um, so that's not too surprising. Now I will say these were the categories that we suggested to them. We also asked them for other topics, which will bubble up a little bit later on. So there was an opportunity to name topics that they thought were important. And then aside from fundraising topics, we also asked about kind of general topics in nonprofit management. Um, and you can see um, staff leadership and staff management issues were highly endorsed as something. Um, so thinking about how fundraisers operate within their organization, often as a key uh, in the executive suite, someone who's working in, in, not in leadership of the organization, how to fit the fundraising uh, role within that, and then perhaps managing staff under you, um, how to uh, interface with communication and marketing roles of, within an organization, board development, design thinking. You can see down the list here um, things that are, are, you might say, well, wait, why does a fundraiser need to know that? But if you think a little bit deeper, it makes complete sense why fun, fun folks doing fundraising roles are not, you know, if you go back to the earlier graphic, 92% of their time is spent doing fundraising. And some of that includes things like working with the board, working on communication and marketing strategies, certainly providing leadership and management. And there's another 8% that they don't consider to be fundraising. And it's likely some of these as well. So these demands on professionals who have fundraising titles um, are broad and are worth uh, thinking about how they relate to their success as a fundraiser. And then this is the last slide um, on these, these kind of data. We, we were interested to know what people felt were the best ways for them to uh, pursue educational offerings to support their fundraising um, professional activities. Obviously, this, this happened during the pandemic. Everybody is involved in webinars and online sessions, so that was the wildly um, favored mode here. But you can see, in general, uh, the preference is for shorter and local uh, opportunities to uh, pursue education and, and support. There is a relatively small group of folks who are, who are interested in multi, full day, multi day kinds of learning that are local and multiple days um, that are so called out of town, but going away to a conference to uh, pursue this kind of learning. So, this again ha has to, we have to think about how we, how we can support professions, uh, professionals in a region with a, combina a combination of learning approaches that meet them uh, where they're at and that they're able to access. It's not just about price point, but it's also about delivery mode um, that we have to consider and how to be successful. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna turn to Dan Mansour, who I already introduced and Dan, are you, are you ready to be spotlighted? I'm spotlighted. Thanks, Rob. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, before we get started into um, uh, study findings in a little more depth, as well as recommendations, um, I thought it'd be helpful to sort of lay out the landscape. And this obviously could take a session in itself. So um, uh, these aren't any um, uh, definitive ideas about the direction, just the things that seem to come to the forefront. Um, one is, you know, the post-COVID uncertainty. Um, our world is certainly changing. I, I think both our work is going to be changing, and I think our audiences are going to be changing, both in the level of engagement and how they get engaged, and that we have to figure out how do we participate in that effectively. Um, I think our industry as a whole is going to be changing. I think we're going to be shifting less uh, from you know, focus on the nonprofit as um, the, uh, the focus of solving problems in our community to turning toward actually solving those problems by whatever means. It might be the concept of for-profit ventures as well as a hybrid um, uh, combination of for-profit, nonprofit partnerships. 
Um, the next is technology. I think our industry really is, is almost behind the times, both in terms of technology and our understanding where that technology is going to be going. Um, and finally, just competition in, in every sense, competition for time and attention, as well as competition um, uh, for the philanthropic dollars and even uh, the, the dollars and discretionary dollars of, of our donors. Um, so with that, uh, let me get into um, one more slide that sort of lays out the landscape. Um, I think all of us in the profession can probably nod our heads and agree in that these fatigues are becoming more and more dominant. Um, I call the first donor fatigue. And that is, uh, while people are inherently willing to give and they really, it's, we're ingrained to be altruistic, whether we're giving dollars away or holding the doors open for people, um, it's not as much fun as it should be. Um, we hear that from our donors, we sense it from our donors. Um, part of it is just the, uh, the volume of requests coming from both people we care about our institutions we care about and those we don't. Um, the second is solicitation fatigue, which Bob um, referred to. Um, in particular, it's a 2019 study out of the Chronicle of Philanthropy um, that talked about, about, I think they started by saying one in four nonprofit leaders are so disappointed in fundraising that they fired their chief, chief fundraising officer. Um, half the chief fundraising officers and organizations are thinking about leaving their jobs within two years. And a portion of those, a significant portion, are thinking of leaving the profession. Um, you know, for those of us in the profession who enjoy what we do, uh, these numbers are shocking. And and final and related to the solicitation fatigue is also the solicitation fatigue of our volunteers, be it board members or um, uh, solicitation volunteers. They're just tired. Um, it seems that the annual fund has become the regular fund, and it's constantly asking. And finally, uh, what I call att attention fatigue, it's just so darn hard to get people's attention today, um, just with the distractions of competition, but also the con distractions of technology. I think coming out of COVID, it may be even uh, a, a bigger challenge as people reflect on their lives and how they want to spend their days. Um, so let's move on. So just looking again at the study's findings and Bob touched on many of these. Um, one thing that um, he didn't mention is that I think we're looking at um, our recommendations for continuing education and ongoing professional development for every stage of the career, not just for either the mid manager or the senior, but even how do we attract people into the profession? It's clear people want a low cost solution. They're interested in multiple opportunities more than they are sort of the epiphanal moment where they figure out what their profession is. Um, related to that is this idea that it's not just the knowledge you gain from a particular interaction, but it is how that knowledge is used and how our continuing education takes place over the lifetime of over our careers. Um, we have touched on the fact that for a path toward diversity and equity has to come through education. Again, more fundamentally than anything else is how do we attract people into the profession um, from diverse um, backgrounds. And that means that our efforts and our recommendations can't only be for those already in the profession, but those who are thinking about or would consider entering the profession. Um, per, the preference in our, from our findings is also again on local and that local today is being defined as your computer screen as much as it is um, the neighborhood that we live in. And finally, uh, something we didn't consider going in, but something that was really apparent in the conversations and also in the feedback from our, uh, the survey is uh, people are sensing and wanting a sense of community, a sense of colleagues, especially with smaller organizations where they might be the only fundraiser in the organization. How do we build a sense of community um, through continuing education, professional development over a long period of time. So you can advance to the next slide and actually the one after that. Um, so this is the recommendations. And these recommendations go beyond essentially just the data we collected. They're really partly my reflections on 35 years of experience in the industry. I like to call this the portfolio approach to professional development as a sort of, as an opposed to the sort of the one shot. Uh, the first uh, sort of revelation, I guess, is rather than fo focusing on just the individual, um, can we gain anything by putting an effort at educating teams 
um, for those working in larger organizations, it, it's kind of hard to be, see, uh, uh, be inspired by a new way of thinking about our work or our profession and coming back into the workplace and having to convince other people to do it. So part of training should be a collective, um, other fundraisers that are on our team. It may include executive directors or board members, either the development committee of a board or the board chair. So that there's a common language and a common understanding of where the profession is going and how we can implement those learnings. The second is besides knowledge is also just understanding the trends and influences within our industry. How does um, you know, the behavioral sciences impact our work? What about design thinking or creative thought? If we are in fact in a conceptual age, creativity is gonna be critical for our success. One, going back to attention fatigue, how do we stand out? And we do that by thinking creatively about our messages, about our approach with our donors and understanding more, care, more uh, in depth the, uh, the psychology of the work that we're doing. And finally, again, this idea of creating within our local communities, and this can happen in Northeast Ohio as well as anywhere else, a sense of community, a philanthropic ethos, I'd like, I guess we could call it, um, that both is among our colleagues in other organizations where we feel a sense of partnership with them, but also a partnership with grant makers and funders as well. And this can extend to both the foundation community the corporate community and our local and regional governments. Rob, the next slide, please. So who are our audiences? As I mentioned, we came into this sort of viewing it as um, you know, the early or mid career, but really it, it became apparent to us to solve all the problems that we were laying out. We needed to take what we knew and the enthusiasm we had for our profession uh, to attract new people to the profession. Um, why aren't people coming out of colleges and universities thinking about not only the nonprofit sector, but fundraising as a career? We know the demand is there from an employment standpoint, and we also know that as an economic engine for many communities, Cleveland and Northeast Ohio in particular, due to our uh, healthcare and our universities. Um, but for those people who care deeply about the environment and want to hand, head into that profession, why wouldn't there be an opportunity for them to learn a little bit more about nonprofit management as part of their formal education? Um, Mid-career goes without saying, a lot of us are trying to learn more as we move along. And then finally, obviously at the leadership level, um, we are counting on servant leadership, the ability of our nonprofit leaders and our managers um, to support the work of development and fundraising in a manner that uh, may exceed what we're doing today. When we talk about the curriculum, we, so normally we focus sort of on what I call core knowledge. You know, it's that chart that Bob shared, uh, major gifts and principal gifts planned giving, I go to a conference or I attend a session to learn that. But the next question I would have is where does practice come in? How do we, is there a way through training, through interaction with colleagues, we, only, we can actually demonstrate our ability to apply the knowledge that we've learned um, in a safe setting that doesn't risk losing a donor or a gift. Um, I, we haven't fully vetted this idea, but it really means that, um, you know, going beyond role playing, let's say, um, but practice is an important part of what we do. Otherwise, knowledge is just accumulation of information. Again, refocusing on trends and influences as part of our learning. What is, what can we anticipate the world look like, may look like in the next few years? And finally, um, you know, what some of us have heard called soft skills, which I understand almost diminishes the value of them. And I'll give you the most obvious example, and that is active listening. I like to say that nobody's ever listened themselves out of a gift as a fundraiser, um, but most of us are not very good at active listening. How can we uh, identify that um, emotional intelligence um, creativity, et cetera, as part of the learning that is important to us, both at initially in our careers as well as long-term. And this particular item came um, clear to us in the in-depth interviews as nonprofit leaders, foundation leaders, um, and philanthropists were 
fairly candid that they saw that the people uh, that were fundraisers, uh, both professional development officers um, and staff, while they certainly understood their industry, they really were lacking in some of the social skills that were important in securing the gifts we're talking about. The next slide, please. So what is the approach to learning? Well, normally, you know, again, when we went into this, we were sort of saying, what are the kinds of events and activities that we can provide? And what became apparent is sort of this, you know, shot off the bow kind of training was not gonna be sufficient. And because people move among organizations as frequently as we do, both for good reasons and bad, and hopefully one of the solutions um, or results of better professional development is the ability and desire to stay on the job at the same organization um, for a longer period of time. The following three things come to mind. Um, the first is um, reflecting on our learning. We come back from a session or a training and immediately dig into the priorities and urgencies of our day. How can reflection of what we've learned or over a period of time um, be a thoughtful way to truly ingrain the knowledge and the new learnings that are available to us? Um, the next is the professional development plan. As, as most of us know, when budgets get cut or when the priority is not um, apparent in terms of financing, um, organizations often, first of all, don't invest enough in professional development and, and often um, cut back um, during leaner times. We need to be responsible as individuals and also encourage our organizations to the best of their ability and our ability to convince that we should have essentially a plan for our career. It can be adapted and changed over time. But again, rather than saying, gosh, I really do want to learn planned giving this week or this month or this year, where does this fit into a long-term view of the kinds of skills, talents, and awareness of the world around us that are going to be important throughout our career? and work toward fulfilling those goals. Um, it may help figure out what at any moment kind of session we want to attend and how that fits into sort of a longer term view of our personal and professional growth. And finally, what came through very clear is this desire for colleagues and colleagues both within our organizations and in our communities. Um, there's a group out of Chicago I chatted with that, you know, they, they were introduced early on in their careers to eight or 10 other people in the similar position at other organizations. And over the course of 20 years, they've been a cohort who've supported each other in their careers, haven't done a study to find out of, as a result, they've stayed with their own organizations longer, but who wouldn't want a group like this to support them in their work? And finally, this last slide is really just um, uh, sort of a, a summary of where we came out of the study. And on the left, you sort of see this sort of development of skills, expansion of knowledge, um, and a building of community as sort of the core um, outcome um, and recommendation of our research. And within that, you can see sort of a more clear definition and these are some of the specific ideas, you know, let's create a boot camp where people who might want to explore a career change or be introduced to the profession um, could on a limited low cost basis begin to explore whether this is something really that they're interested in. And this will be available later for you know for you to look at more carefully. So that's pretty much, you know, the the summary of both the findings and as we've massaged our ideas and the responses from, um, from the survey, um, a different view, I believe, of how one can approach um, expansion of knowledge, um, professional development. And I'm gonna add personal development because I think as we grow personally, um, as we develop the kinds of skills that make us better human beings, as a result, we'll also be much more effective and more successful as fundraisers. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was fantastic. Uh, great walk through. Um, I will say that uh, the full report is is available. We'll make that available to everyone. Um, and now I'm going to introduce two folks who had access to the full report. And I'm sure they've combed through it. And we've asked them to uh, come and help us make meaning of 
of what Dan has presented and also what the what they saw in the broader report. And I'll tell you why we invited both of these folks. Um, the first is Bob Kane, uh, who at the time we started the study was the president of the uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals of Greater Cleveland, and in some ways was an instigator uh, for this study to happen uh, because of things he'd observed in his, his, uh, his role at AFP, but also in his own practice over many years. And Bob uh, is well known for his, uh, I believe he received the title Executive Director Emeritus uh, from the Lakeland Foundation and uh, at Lakeland Community College. Um, you can read more about Bob's career, but that's, um, uh, he's partly here to help us connect this to uh, the professional um, community that has existed around AFP, not just here, but around the country and how to think about how this, how this intersects with that work. And then our second discussant is Cecil Lipscomb, who's the executive director of United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland. Uh, and Cecil, aside from being a relatively new executive director in a few year, within a few years, has really set himself apart and, as one of the most well-regarded executives um, working in our community. Uh, he spent time doing uh, development at Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve. And if you don't know UBF, what you should know about them is they are both a funder, but also a fundraiser. Um, and they work critically with um, small grassroots organizations to support their capacity to do the work well, dominantly in communities of color. Um, so a really key population of organizations uh, for us to be concerned with as we think about how to support uh, fundraising professionals. So we've asked them each to speak a bit and provide their thoughts. So we're gonna turn to Bob. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. You know, you uh, you know you've been around for a long time when you start looking at the uh, names coming up on the chat box and see that uh, I uh, probably know three quarters of the people whose names appeared uh, before. I don't know what that means, but I guess I've been around a long time. I also want to thank you know uh, uh, what Rob's done, what Dan's done and what Cecil and I are doing uh, every day. You'll hear a little bit more about what uh, Cecil and I are up to these days, but uh, this has been a tremendous amount of uh, work. And uh, here's one now uh, on the chat box here, and uh, a tremendous amount of work for us, but I think it's paying off. I think what we're doing is truly unique. Uh, we've, uh, as Rob said, we've shared this already with the AFP National Office, and uh, uh, they're interested in what we're doing. They're talking about the fact that what we're doing is unique. So when we think about what we wanna have happen here, it's to make a difference in Cleveland. That's where we started, but it's to make a difference uh, uh, much more broadly than just uh, Northeast Ohio. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, how this uh, idea came up in the first place. This is sort of the prequel to the whole uh, uh, study that uh, Rob and Dan uh, talked about. So before there was a study, this is what uh, came into some of our heads, including uh, mine. Um, as AFP president, people thought they could come up to me and uh, gently talk about the fundraising uh, profession and philanthropy in Cleveland. And so these are some of the things that I heard. These are, these are for real, I'm not making them up, but it got me thinking, see if it gets you thinking. So uh, donors would tell me, fundraisers seem to come and go so often. Well, you saw Dan's uh, statistic before, what is it? We last 16 months, I've seen some studies that say 18, some studies now that say a year, whatever it is, people are coming and going pretty frequently. Um, then one uh, donor said, some of the fundraisers I've seen lately just don't seem to have much on the ball. Are the wrong people entering the field? Are we doing a poor job of training them? Now, you know, mostly during these times, I was a good listener 
uh, as Dan uh, talked about before. And, you know, as a result, we put this together, began talking to other people, and we were, were where we are today. Um, another guy said, uh, some fundraisers don't keep, uh, seem capable of starting and maintaining a relationship with me. It seems that all they want to do is come in, ask for money, get a response, and move on. They're not looking at the long term. And then some talk about fundraisers missing the basics. So they talk about things like, well, these uh, fundraisers came in so, uh, to see me the other day and they weren't dressed properly. Now, this is an interesting thing because, you know, my guess is that this was an older donor and he felt that they should have come in, uh, you know, with a tie and jacket or whatever, and they didn't. Uh, a younger donor may not feel that way, but that's the point. We need to learn about the various people that we uh, are touching. Um, the other thing that I thought was so important and has been in my mind all this time is um, they would say, you know, I see people from the clinic, I see people from UH, I see people from Case Western Reserve, but then I don't see people from the smaller nonprofits. And it's got me thinking more and more that uh, uh, something's wrong. We certainly don't have a level playing field for the small nonprofits versus the large nonprofits. And I've been thinking a lot about how we can level the field so that the small nonprofits uh, can uh, can get in front of the people they should get in front of and do fundraising at the level that some of us in bit larger organizations uh, should be uh, doing. On the fundraiser side, what I talked about before was donors. On the fundraiser side, what uh, I'm uh, seeing more and more is people, especially during the pandemic, have said, I keep getting these things about uh, courses, webinars, you know, you guys are all getting them too. Um, but the, what they're saying is, I have no idea which of these are quality, which of these are crap, which I should go for, which I shouldn't. What they usually end up going for, unfortunately, is the stuff that's free or pretty close to free. And um, uh, I'm not sure uh, that that's the, uh, that that's the uh, way to go. Um, but where there are good programs that cost money, very often people are saying to me, my organization simply can't afford to send me to those uh, programs. The larger organizations, it seems, if you can make this generalization, um, are able to put some dollars into it, send people to some of these programs. The smaller organizations, there's no way they can even touch this sort of thing. So let me tell you something. If there's one thing that we ought to do out of this process, it's to make sure that any of our professionals, maybe with a stretch, but any of our professionals should be able to att attend uh, the best uh, programs around and enhance their, uh, their careers. So that's the background. That's why we began thinking about doing the study. And that led, in fact, with uh, help of the Smith Foundation to our actually doing the, uh, the uh, study. Now, what all that did for me was got me thinking about, well, if I was to create programs right now, what would those programs look like to help us be the best fundraisers around? So I'm just going to list for you some of the things that I'm interested in. You should think about whether these are things that, you know, might interest you, might be things that we uh, ought to do here in Northeast Ohio. We can't do all of these uh, for a number of reasons. But if we could pick a few of these and make them happen, make them happen fairly soon, uh, it, would, uh, it would be terrific. So first of all, um, I think through the Mandel School, we can do uh, some of the uh, programs that, um, that uh, Rob talked about in his presentation. You know, major gifts usually comes out on top is the thing that we professionals want to uh, uh, take advantage of most. So maybe it's that. But certainly, uh, it could be some of the other things. Planned giving, you know, still, uh, even though I've been working with that for years, 
Some people are interested in, some people are not. Some people think they can get their arms around it. Some people are afraid to get their arms around it. So we have to think about that uh, a little bit more. But some of the other areas that came out high, like stewardship, uh, I think is a critical one for us to be looking at doing. And behavioral uh, uh, science uh, also, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Also, as part of these classes, there have been other things on my mind lately that we ought to be thinking about doing uh, to teach our uh, professionals. And those are programs on leadership, um, how to tell a good story, how to overcome intimidation. I'm finding, uh, yeah, I could talk about each of these for a long time, but I'm finding on the intimidation side that a lot of people, a lot of fundraisers, especially in the small nonprofits, are often intimidated to pick up the phone, walk in the door, ask one of the large foundations for dollars. Uh, even some of the small foundations, they're just intimidated. On the other hand, when I or Cecil or somebody like that begin to work with them to uh, encourage them uh, to walk through the door, they do it and they're off and running and uh, they become different kinds of fundraisers in the future. So intimidation is important. Um, uh, some other areas that I'm playing around with are courage. There's a guy in town, Scott Simon. I don't know if any of you uh, uh, knew him, worked at the Jewish Federation years ago. Now he's doing some other things, but um, uh, doing some work on courage. Uh, courage on the donor side, courage on the fundraiser side. Interesting stuff. Another one, a lot of people, several people that I've seen in the last couple of weeks are doing work on gratitude. Now, the coolest gratitude thing I ever saw uh, was uh, a guy out of uh, Pittsburgh. Maybe you know what I'm going to say. A guy out of Pittsburgh who does a program on what Mr. Rogers has to say about gratitude in fundraising was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. But it's stuff like that where we could be a bit creative about uh, what we do. Here are some other things that I think we should be thinking about. Um, I think it'd be great to take, say, a half a day, maybe, maybe three hours uh, once a year where we would highlight some of the greatest, most creative, most interesting fundraising taking place in Northeast Ohio. Uh, at that time or over the past years. You know, I'm probably as plugged in as anybody, and I can't tell you what nonprofits in Greater Cleveland uh, are doing in the way of fundraising. Um, you hear about the big ones, you hear about somebody surpassing a billion dollars, but you don't hear about creative ways or partnership ways uh, that cool things are happening. The next one that I think is also important uh, is academic studies. I'd like to take a half a day also uh, once a year to get an update on what kind of new academic studies have been done on fundraising in the past year. You know, I taught a course, a graduate course at uh, John Carroll uh, a few months ago. And so I had to, I probably wouldn't have otherwise, I had to look at the literature. And what I began to see was um, there was a whole volume of hidden literature. Some of it was in the psychology. That's why I thought it was so cool that you talked about behavioral stuff, Rob. But some, some was in psychology, some sociology, some public policy, some political science. But there was stuff that touched on our work in, uh, in uh, fundraising. So if we could you know, pull out some very important um, uh, academic studies from the past year, talk about them, talk about it uh, uh, among our colleagues. Uh, I think it would be terrific. Um, then bringing together uh, uh, our uh, fundraisers in small groups. I'll tell you, uh, uh, Dan mentioned before a cohort that was 20 years old. 20 years ago, Rob, were you around then 20 years ago? I can't remember. Um, but 20 years ago, um, you guys did a thing called Leaders Link. You remember that thing? So I was part of a link 20 years ago with a great group of people. And although some came and went over the years, we kept that thing going uh, long past when uh, the Mandel School uh, decided it was enough already. So probably 15, 16 years. Then uh, in my link, we dropped it. But then we started it again a few months ago. 
And what a pleasure it is. We were all executive directors of nonprofit agencies. What a pleasure it is to be able to have a group like that to talk about the future and where we're going and what a difference we can make and uh, what, ha what is happening that's uh, creative. Um, uh, just wonderful. So uh, Leaders Link was a great uh, example. Um, then I want to do more mentoring programs too. I think that's important that people like me that are on their way out uh, help young people that are coming into the field. And maybe through that, we could also help uh, encourage them to stay in the field when they have those days when they're not so hot uh, about, uh, about staying in the field. The issue that's on my mind, I don't know if it's on any of yours, is with we playing the role of mentor, it usually means that you know we have our act together and we know what we're doing. Well, the reality is we make lots of mistakes. And uh, you know, I don't know how to do, like AFP has a major mentoring program, which I wanna continue, but I wanna continue it, but I also wanna keep people's eyes open to the fact that you know, maybe we uh, guys uh, and, uh, and women who uh, represent the, uh, the uh, old generation uh, don't know it all. So uh, I'd like to look at that some more. Um, and then I'd like to look at, you know, what are the best programs around? What's AFP doing? What's Candid doing? What are some of the other places doing? And then secondarily, just as important, how do I make sure there's access for all of you fundraisers out there and access especially for people from the small organizations, the uh, uh, what we're finding is the African-American led organizations, the programs that are serving African-Americans just uh, uh, aren't able to afford uh, going to these sorts of uh, programs. So how do we make that happen? What does a scholarship program look like? Um, those kinds of issues. And then, you know, I'm, I'm also very interested in how do we ensure that we're not just giving lip service to this whole area of uh, equity and inclusion? You know, we talk about it all the time, but I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, I know some of you out there will tell me we're doing some very good things. We're getting some very good results. Well, I'm worried that not enough of us are getting good results. And how can we work together? Maybe in this case, Rob, how can we work together with the Mandel School to attract the right people, keep them around, train them, and make them our future, which is what they uh, should be. Um, I also have a thought about uh, what we ought to be doing with uh, young people. Um, and how can we encourage people in high school? How can we encourage undergraduates uh, to be thinking about uh, going into uh, this field? Bottom line is, you know, Rob and Dan are uh, outstanding uh, academics. They're gonna put together some programs that are first rate, but we need some money to make this all happen. And I'm telling you, you know, if there's anything that I wanna do to make a difference in, uh, in uh, the world going forward, it's to use what I know to raise some money, to make sure that they can do the things that they're dreaming up right now. So if any of you, I'll leave you with this, if any of you are interested in uh, you know, joining me, making a difference in the world in that way, we're fundraisers. There's what, uh, 90 or so participants on this call at this point, we're fundraisers. Let me know if you wanna help me uh, fundraise and uh, make a difference in our world. With that, back to you, Rob. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob. I can see that you you do not need to uh, attend a course on on story telling a good story, um, <laughs> but you may be you may need to be the instructor of that of that course. <laughs> and we're going to we're going to turn to Cecil Lipscomb, who is also known as someone who can uh, fashion a good tale. Um, <laughs> yeah, so but, C but Cecil, I, I'll, I'll take it over to you. Thank you, Bob. And I bow down to uh, Bob at all accounts. Um, and Bob, when you said, um, you know, us old fundraisers, I said, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, but then I saw a, a, a person in the chat say they were 24 year old fundraiser looking for a mentor. I said, okay, I'm in the old guy category. <laughs> um, so here, here, here's my thoughts. Um, in order for us to attract um, new 
and diverse groups into the profession of fundraising, we have to uh, fish in a different pond. We can't go to the same sources um, and expect different outcomes. And, and that's for our educational institutions, our corporate partners, as well as our um, uh, nonprofit leaders looking for uh, professionals or professional fundraisers. Um, the reason this is in, in 2021 is important is because I just recently filled out an application uh, as a grant uh, for a grant uh, from a local foundation. And there were at least five questions on RDEI, race, diversity, equity, and inclusion in that application. And it was referencing how we were positioned internally uh, to connect to diverse communities. We know that it's, it's a part of the future. It may not have been comfortable for everybody to get to this point, but it's a discussion that's on the table. And so the elephant in the room for me is, hey, I, I represent a small African-American led organization. Um, and I even have to answer those questions. You know, <laughs> We have to make sure that equity is a part of all of our conversations. And, um, and we have to represent the communities that we are serving and we care about. Um, so I think our profession in terms of fundraisers could and should be uh, focused in that area. So I just wanted to call that out uh, initially. Um, and, and I am a product of uh, that uh, fishing in another pond, if you will. I came from corporate America and transferable skills and all was probably not the greatest fundraiser in my first few years, but through education and engaging with my, my, my former professor, Rob Fisher and, and many others working alongside the Dan Monsoors and, and Bob uh, Cains of the world, uh, I, I feel like I understand and know what I'm doing at this point. Um, and so we can, we can look uh, uh, for those things and the education um, uh, that we as an industry, and I'll say as a sector in the nonprofit sector in Northeast Ohio, um, could advance. Um, a few things about, and, and as was referenced about UBF, United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland, we identified uh, some of the, the needs early on. Um, I, I've, I've been uh, with the organization for a few years now, and uh, we started doing uh, training at the community level uh, for small, uh, primarily African-American led organizations at the Mount Pleasant Community Development Corporate Office. First couple sessions was, you know, 10, 12 people. And I just had my grants manager go over and just talk about grant writing. How do you, how do you, you know, approach an organization? Now, some 400 people later, we have success stories of those similar grantees applying for direct money from UBF, meeting the criteria of being in existence for three to four years and um, having a stable board and all of those things. Now, now we're at the generation of this, uh, let's call it training, that other funders are supporting those organizations that went through those initial courses. And, and then in comes Hurricane Maria and then a global pandemic and the citizens uh, in Puerto Rico needed our assistance. So we took the training that we did in the neighborhood here in Cleveland, worked with Leadership Cleveland to translate into Spanish, <laughs> worked with FEMA and translators to train using that same format in virtually uh, to 600 nonprofit leaders over a few days in, um, in Puerto Rico. They asked if we could do it uh, in South America because they had colleagues in South America. Here's little bitty United Black Fund um, on, a, on a global stage uh, in demand. Uh, we, we had no idea um, going into the first few sessions when those 10 people were coming um, and again, albeit very small uh, startup type nonprofits to the point now where we have 
um, uh, seasoned executives sitting in some of those courses. Um, we, we have also, and I just want to give you a couple of other examples, just because it's relevant for our, our topics today, our topic today. Um, we have uh, the Center for Thriving Organizations that we're developing internally, because we acknowledge that there needs to be more formality to how we engage that stakeholder base um, in, in the small to medium size, primarily African American led organizations. Um, so it's fundraisers that need assistance. They, you know, they need fiscal management and financial training and uh, leadership training and, and so forth. And, and so uh, it was critical for me to align with people like Bob um, because we recognized the expertise that was uh, needed um, on a formal basis. And, and I can't even tell you um, how many calls and, and responses we received from the positive outcomes from Bob just basically having nice, good sessions with people. Uh, one comment, as Bob referenced some of the comments on the other side of the house from donors, one of the agencies said, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a virtual call and they said, oh no, we cannot, at this point, we can't contact our donors. Everybody's hurting for resources right now. And you know, I saw, you know, Bob shaking on the call and, and, and I, you know, we tried to address to say, this is the absolute time. This is the very uh, point in which you should be asking for support um, and telling your story. And so it's that, 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 that dis displays a gap in, in understanding um, that education can fill. And I think uh, as, as fundraising professionals understand um, you have to be bold um, and you have to always uh, be going for an ask. The, the, the other component that I'd share is in particularly for the African-American community, there wasn't a recognition of philanthropy being formal in general. There, there, there was an overall uh, good deeds component and, you know, through the church you give money, but to actually call it philanthropy, oh, that meant you had to build a building. You had to put your name on a, you know, on the side of a wall there. Um, so we, we uh, in 2018, I got with some uh, local uh, executives, uh, Connie and Kevin Johnson and Telly and Jay Thomas, you may know the names, um, and we pulled together and brought in the soul of philanthropy and made it our own, the Soul of Philanthropy Cleveland, TSOP CLE is what we would reference. And it was through that process that we educated the community on, be, on seeing themselves as philanthropists. And so in, 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 in the African-American community, uh, I'll be the first to admit, I couldn't even, I'm like, what do you say, philanthropic? What is that? I had to look it up before coming into the industry. Didn't even understand how it could connect to good deeds and the love of mankind. But, but to see yourself as a philanthropist um, is, is critical. And so as fundraisers are engaging with new communities of you know, philanthropists, they must also have a component of education that permeates through that cultural barrier. Um, but all that to say what we know now. Um, the, the what we know now is that there's pent up demand, particularly in small and mid-sized organizations. As Bob referenced, there is a notion of meaningful impact, kind of that up close and personal uh, contribution for the small nonprofit. Dick Pope's uh, scholarship, Bob coordinated our uh, engagement with uh, Dick and, and we literally have a cohort of nonprofit executives that uh, Dick has sponsored uh, with AFP. They love it. And we, we, we treat it as a cohort and how they are engaging and they come back from sessions and share the knowledge and new learnings. So it opens up networks um, when, you, when you introduce the, the side of formal philanthropy to even this um, small and medium sized sector. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to close quickly so we don't go too far over. But in addition to um, the small and medium sized nonprofit, we have the African-American led nonprofit who um, I think as uh, was referenced earlier, 
who says, wait a minute, to go from Cleveland to Pebble Beach for a fundraising conference, uh, that's not happening. You know, that's a waste. That's not worthwhile for you to come back with theory in a mediocre network of potential donors. And so the nonprofit executives push against even the uh, fundraiser who wants to seek new knowledge and advanced training. And so we have to understand that we have to meet people where they are. And I think some of our uh, innovative responses to the pandemic has allowed for us to create low cost options uh, for, uh, for folks. And again, I, I come from a world of working in major, large nonprofits. Um, and so I think even those institutions would advance uh, the career track and study um, if we created um, these more um, localized training options. And then we have to, the last thing I'll end with in the interest of time is we have to connect the dots to what is happening um, around the world and what our responsibility is right here at home. Um, we are creating things and have created things that are touching issues that have global implications. And we have to allow those institutions and individuals to build a culture of collaboration, uh, hence why I'm directly involved with this group right here, um, and not create a culture of conflict. We don't pay nonprofit uh, fundraisers commission because we don't want the selfish motivation to be the um, out front, right? We want, we want that to be kind of um, uh, in, a, in a place where uh, it's not paramount uh, to, for someone's survival. We also need to make sure that the institution itself doesn't portray those same qualities. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Rob, and thank you all for allowing me to participate in today's discussion. Thank you, Cecil. That was fantastic. Um, so I'm going to put out the call to um, if you want to post anything to the chat, any questions or observations that you'd uh, like the panel to respond to. We've got a good chunk of time here. And um, I wanted to start with a, a comment that came up earlier, um, kind of endorsing the idea around knowing your audience as a fundraiser. And generational and I'll add cultural differences in so-called mores and forays uh, among donors. And how, um, you know, I guess, you know, the simplistic view that, okay, if we wanna be successful as an organization, we wanna have uh, white solicitors soli go to white donors, that there's some, some, there's some key knowledge in that matching. I mean, we've gone through this in social work where we think about to what extent do we need to match staff with clients in some key ways. But I think that's, uh, I wanna ask the group, you know, how much of this can be taught versus, you know, fought through in the practice as a new fundraiser? How, mu how much can we do to support people in quickly learning the ways to know your audience well as a fundraiser? Or it's just, just some people just good at it and others don't, aren't, you know, and that's just, Bob, you said earlier, are we attracting, somebody said, are we attracting the right people to the field? Um, some I people, think, you know, you know, I think it's interesting, Rob. Um, I think there's so much, you know, we always think we know a lot. We're the fundraisers. We've been around for years. We ought to know. I'm telling you, I think we don't know. So wouldn't it be interesting to um, uh, put together a little experiment and try out some of the things that you're talking about? You know, let's see, let's see uh, the extent to which it's, uh, you know, in you or not in you or the extent to which we can teach you about this. I mean, I would try I, I would think it would be uh, very interesting to put together a, um, uh, an effort uh, to uh, train uh, and, uh, and uh, use our professionals that way and see how it goes. I think we just don't know the answers and it's okay to say it. Yeah, 
And, and my, my only uh, comment as, a, as an African-American fundraiser who fundraised in the South and the North and, and out West as well, um, it, 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 it matters, um, but not as much as we believe. Um, it, it, if a professional uh, comes to the table that's well-trained, uh, they can uh, overcome um, the traditional obstacles of race and racism um, on the behalf of the institution. Now, it may take a couple of extra visits. I don't know. Maybe it's in terms of efficiency. Um, I'd love to see that study, Bob, right? But, but in the end, um, you know, having, <laughs> having visited all types of folks around the country, um, I think when you, at the end of the day, they look at the quality of the person and the institution represented and the cause. Now, my theory is if the person can't get past those things, then they wouldn't necessarily be donors to the institutions that I choose to represent um, because that's what we care about, you know? So that, that's my, my two cents. No, we, we were, we're all thinking about as we should be, um, these kinds of issues, you know, should an African American be the solicitor of a white person or vice versa? And uh, I'm telling you, I have found over the years that there are so many other issues that we ought to be looking at at the same time that might be more important. So, you know, uh, uh, to me over the years, believe it or not, everybody, uh, probably the thing that connected me to donors more than anything else was uh, running. Uh, you know, I'm a runner. And, uh, and I would sit down with people, I'm, I don't know how, but I bet more than half of my donors were, were uh, runners. That's what interested them. That's what connected us. And uh, I would think that that was at least as important as people's race. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you got to think beyond just, uh, you know, uh, this one issue. But you can't forget it. It's still there. It's still important. Yeah. See, so we had a an interesting comment. I think you had made the point about the importance of collaboration, and this comment was about how there's this lack of soft skills or appetite for collaboration, and how that uh, lack of appreciation of those those things really undercuts effectiveness. So, I mean, we, we, we teach, we preach and teach collaboration in, in the nonprofit sector. What, what do you think we, I mean, what, what's holding people back? What, I, I think about the individual who's yes, pro collaboration, but they're in an organization that is much more tentative. So thinking about the culture of organizations versus the, the approach of the individual and whether that's a, a factor for some of our fundraisers um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I call that out intentionally because um, fundraisers are groomed uh, in, in many regards to, um, to be, uh, to operate with self-interest by the type of organization that they work for. And, and, and in some cases they are allowed to, to work in partnership with their colleagues and so forth. The, the, the notion of soft skills being uh, connected to that is not traditionally uh, highlighted. Um, the, the, to go out and say, okay, I'm going to work with a colleague that's uh, in a medical institution and, and seek my, my uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the heart space and I'm going to seek my, my peer in the, in the kidney space and, and we're going to go out and do a tag team. The only reason that you would traditionally go and, uh, on a joint visit is because you need a principal gift officer or you need somebody with planned giving background. Um, but um, that may not be the story for everyone, right? My, my objective with UBF, and, and the reason I'm on this call, we, you, you, you heard me reference that um, we are doing some of this work, but the growth and the impact of what we can achieve in partnership um, with other institutions and colleagues is far greater than what we can do on our own. And, and many major institutions, including our larger um, uh, systems of delivery here uh, in Northeast Ohio could benefit from that mindset. Um, and I'm not sure, sure that, you know, if it's a, a training, uh, I think uh, in kind of preparation for this meeting, 
someone discussed like, how, how do we get executives at the table to um, kind of infiltrate the culture of, of nonprofit and philanthropy um, so that it's just not on the backs of fundraisers um, seeking uh, collective impact. Um, and again, um, small, small nonprofits need the opportunity to grow. Medium nonprofits need to be given the opportunity to become the YWCAs and the, uh, the various Salvation Armies of the world. How did they start? And what did they, uh, work, what, were, what tables were they allowed to uh, sit at in order for them to grow? You know, that, that's, that's kind of my, my, uh, my thought around the subject. Well, and I think just just to just to add, I, I think um, if there's something, Rob, that you and the uh, university or other universities can do to encourage this kind of partnership, if there's something the funders could do to encourage these kinds of partnerships, I think it would be it would be terrific. This is what we ought to be looking at. I'm, I'm telling you, there's no better example right now than the uh, AFP UBF. Uh, cohort that we put together. Here's, here's a program where we're teaching small nonprofits to do uh, first rate fundraising. I meet with them every month. We bring in other speakers. You should see the, uh, the uh, list of speakers, including you two guys, Dan and Rob, who spoke with them uh, a month ago or so. Um, and what was holding us up? We needed a few bucks to get it started. What did we do? Well, in this case, we went to Dick Pogue and he put the, uh, the money in. We even had him at one of our sessions. Remember that Cecil, where mm -hmm. he was thrilled. So if anybody needs, any fundraiser needs motivation to do a program like that, it's looking at that smile on Dick Pogue's face as he realizes that he's making a difference in the world for a few bucks. Bob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let a, uh, the cat out of the bag and, and, and don't, don't hurt me anyone on the call. <laughs> Dick said this was the most efficient use of his funds that he's ever deployed. <laughs> but all, that cool. means, all that means is I didn't ask for enough money. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, get, we're getting a lot of great questions. Bob, you mentioned funders and we had a comment about how do we engage funders in this dialogue? Uh, and the specific point, people are talking about the rise of trust-based philanthropy, but that's existed a lot, a long time, but it's been predominantly uh, among white donors. And how do we get foundations invested in creating a more equitable future for nonprofit growth through fundraising? Anybody got a smart idea? Bob, you want to pick that up? I wish I did have a smart idea. I don't, I don't have an answer, but, but let me tell you, I think we've started already talking to a number of the foundations in town and a number of donors in town. Um, what, what we're doing here, what the four of us are doing uh, now, and I hope many more of you join uh, us on, uh, has been taking place. And I think we'll build on that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure uh, whether there's uh, something implied in this question that you know, the foundations are doing things the old way and they're not changing. And, you know, first of all, you know, I got to tell you, there's a good deal of literature these days about the foundations and, uh, and how they're changing. But even more important, here in Northeast Ohio, I think we're seeing some pretty cool stuff. I mean, if you look alone at what, uh, what the uh, Kelvin and Eleanor Smith are doing for this, for this program, uh, it's pretty amazing. If you take a look at what the Cleveland Foundation is doing uh, and its leadership that it's taking around the country among community uh, foundations, it's pretty amazing. If you look at what the Gunn Foundation uh, is doing uh, uh, around issues around democracy and uh, related subjects, you know, uh, we're doing some pretty cool things in Cleveland. And so this is one of the things that got me and Dan and Rob and Cecil interested in all this. Cleveland has been known over the years for doing interesting things. We're seeing that it's beginning to do interesting things again. And we're seeing that they could be uh, first rate partners uh, with us in making all this stuff happen. So Rob, Rob, I'd love to just real quick reference that 
sometimes with smaller nonprofits, there's a trust factor with the donor. And um, because we don't know, you know, this is a fairly, um, you know, new thing maybe. Um, and what we found is that uh, leveraging our relationship with certain donors in town as more or less a fiscal sponsor, we don't do fiscal agency, but in fiscal sponsorship, we serve as kind of that bridge to build uh, confidence uh, with the donor. So at the end of the day, we hope that we can um, uh, serve in that capacity to build more trust um, for uh, many of our, our donors. Um, at the end, uh, we have certain examples where we've done that uh, and, and then a million dollar anonymous gift has come in for that small nonprofit. Um, uh, and shout out to Demetrius Williams and Beating the Streets. Uh, you know, it, just amazing stories like that have happened just from us guiding that small institution and um, growing uh, the relationship to uh, give them more visibility. Now, Cecil, while we're on it, you know, we're talking about Demetrius. Now, I don't know who, who in the audience knows this guy, but he has, of all things, a program that teaches kids wrestling and character. Uh, and and he himself is amazing. And if, if we as a community aren't investing in him uh, and his skills as well as his program, we're nuts. Absolutely, I agree, I agree, yeah. We've got a couple of notes about uh, people uh, who wanted wanted to hear hear more about the Mr. Rogers Gratitude Program. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we can maybe we can follow up with that. And and there's a there's an interest in the hidden library of research that you mentioned, Bob, and how we can how folks can gain access to this. Where you, uh, you send me you send me a note, and I'll and I'll try to uh, and I'll try to get you this stuff. <laughs> Okay. I've just had, I just, it's, it's piled up in my uh, office uh, at home right now. And if I can make sense out of it, I'd love to get it to you. We need to get a white paper out on that. <laughs> um, there was a note about, well, D Dan, you, you mentioned the whole uh, thing about um, acting. Uh, training in theater, and it, it, it led to several comments about I think there's a niche in the storytelling piece, but also being a more, more confident in your way, Bob, that came up earlier about the, intim yeah. the intimidation concerns. Um, can you just talk about that? I mean, people, people may not, people think, oh, I need to learn how to do plan giving, but they're not thinking about something like that. Well, you know, I think when you're when you're taking a class in acting or you're serving as an actor, you're playing a role. And even as fundraisers, we're playing a role. You know, first thing I want to say is it doesn't mean we're being any less sincere about who we, who we are. It's just we're being more effective. I think acting is about gaining self-confidence to present in a way that you're not overly concerned about, you know, how you are perceived or who you are or were, et cetera. The thought comes to mind because I, I know that, um, you know, when you're giving a, pre a speech or a presentation, you know, it's one thing if you are, you know, trying to memorize and nervous about what you're saying. It's another if you're essentially acting. Um, it, you know, I think actors are very comfortable being in front of an audience and whether that audience is one or many. So that, I think it's just an interesting skill to learn. And um, it's actually something I hear happening more and more in business schools where they're asking leaders to take an acting class as part of the, the, uh, the course curriculum because, Basically, we're in front of people presenting the rest of our lives. Um, related to that, you know, we are often asked, you know, can, you, can we do some role playing on how to make a solicitation? And as some of you know, in some of my presentations, I use movie clips because I figure an Academy Award winning actor is much better than I am. And uh, Robin Williams gives an amazing presentation in front of the board in the movie Awakenings. Um, so much to learn from that scene and the scene right pr prior to it in the dining room of the cafeteria. And in the movie uh, Green Card, Andy McDowell ends up getting some trees for her green gorillas in New York City, thanks to uh, a little bit of piano playing by Gerard Depardieu. And so I, I think there are ways that we can learn how to do our profession by simply being more observant as well. Rob, if, if I can just... Um... 
uh, address uh, something Dan, when Dan was talking that kind of made me recall that we haven't really addressed the issue of uh, churn in the sector. Um, I, I do want to hit on that in that um, it's almost a running joke. Like when you come in the nonprofit uh, fundraising space, you say, you know, it's, it's in dog years. And so maybe your study is a little off because you didn't count it in, in dog years. And that's part of the culture of philanthropy, you know, people cycling to different organizations, they hit uh, to a point of maturity, and maybe that's two to three years, and then they go to the next one, or, or they get to a point where they kind of stop, um, they maximize what they can do at the particular organization, and they go to the other uh, uh, next. Um, we have to uh, address this um, uh, nature that, that is um, a, a part of the uh, culture of philanthropy um, and, and I think we can do it by um, dealing at the institutional level. Not, I, I think the individual has the desire to do a good job, has a desire to advance, and um, with the appropriate training, um, it can, can accomplish success. So I don't think it's a quality um, person uh, issue, a quality issue in terms of the pipeline of fundraisers. I think that institutions have to wrestle with the long game or long range strategy and the short term outcomes that's needed uh, in order for, um, quite frankly, their, their institution to survive and thrive. Um, and again, that's addressing um, the, the conflict between the actual employer and employee uh, and the expectations. So mm. I, really, uh, I really think that, you know, for the professionals that are on this call, um, we should give it much consideration and, and, and as Bob uh, so eloquently put, please come alongside us and address this issue um, because we're all facing it um, as, a, as a sector. And I see, so you know, the reason, some of the, one of the top two reasons or two of the top reasons people leave is one is they're not feeling like they're growing on the job. It's not that they don't like their work. It's not that they don't like their, but they're not, they're not their days and their years sort of start to run into each other. So how do we make sure that's happening? Um, they're not in necessarily interested in them leaving. Um, the others are not respected. In other words, their opinions aren't valued, um, not just in terms of their role within fundraising, but their contributions to the broader organization as a whole. I think institutions and maybe communities as a whole can be a lot more creative. I mean, imagine a job switching where, you know, for six months you work on another job and somebody who's your equivalent comes into your um, operation, you know, somebody as a fundraiser for United Way gets to work at the Cleveland Clinic for six months, learning new techniques, appreciating the skills that they do have that they are now bringing to an organization and learning new ones that they can bring back to their home organization, especially for those people that want to stay in the community. It does two things. It improves them on the job and it also retains the relationship and the longevity and experience at their, at their home organization. Um, I'd love to see something like that. I'd like to see that happen, you know, even to the point, you know, my first job in fundraising was with a university. How exciting would it be, especially when I'm single and, uh, you know, have the time and flexibility to take an assignment at a quote unquote rival university to learn how they do it. Something I observed a long time ago is people often go to conferences um, fairly disgruntled and complaining about their work, but they come back very appreciative of the organization they're in when they hear about all the troubles at, at other organizations. Um, it shouldn't require us to actually take a job in another organization to realize we didn't want to leave in the first place. We, we, have, we have really hit uh, the tail end of this. Um, so we have, we have more questions that we didn't get to, but uh, what we'll commit to do is share that with the panel and see if we can um, get any responses for those. For th so thank you all for those um, great comments and questions in the chat. We want to thank you for making time for this. I want to thank uh, Dan, Bob, and Cecil for being a part of this uh, tremendous conversation. Um, more to come. Um, and I, I do want to also thank anybody on the call who happened to be either one of our key informants or uh, participated in the survey. Without your uh, taking that moment to, to be a part of, of this, we wouldn't be at the place we are and, and hopefully better understanding how to support our professionals. Um, the last thing I'll mention is we'll have another uh, session uh, on June 8th. Um, 
which I think is maybe going to come up, but it's uh, we're going to do a session on the art of fundraising. Uh, it'll be June 8th at the same time as today's uh, 2 to 3.30. Look for um, additional follow-up on that. Uh, and uh, also coming out after the close today, you'll receive a survey about this session. We really would welcome your comments. Um, and I thank the couple folks who in the chat also said they were willing to work with Bob on fundraising uh, for this kind of work. We welcome all of you um, and we uh, totally value your experience, uh, expertise in this area. So thank you uh, very much for the time today and we'll look forward to seeing you in the near future. Bye-bye.